So all good things start with tea. <laughs> so today, the same book, and we're only on chapter two, but it's, you know, it's a meaty little book, this, because Bhikkhu Bodhi is taking out key passages from all over the suttas and grouping them together, as you know, in various themes. So the theme we're on is the personal training, and we've already covered aspects such as generosity, um, a lot about virtue, being able to differentiate between um, wholesome and unwholesome actions that lead to suffering or that lead to happiness for oneself, others, and both. So we're always looking at it in that threefold way. So it's not just, is this good for me? Or is this good for you? Or, but is this good for us both? And ideally all beings. And then reflecting on that. So the Buddha's advice to Rahulu was talking about reflecting in those ways about whether it's for our own or others benefit or both while you're doing the action of body, speech or mind during the action of body, speech or mind, and also after completing that action of body, speech or mind. So we have so many opportunities to reflect, to put the brakes of mindfulness on, so to speak, if we do find we're going off course. And even if on reflection afterwards, we find we did act on skillfully, then there are certain ways that we can um, help ourselves to move on by revealing it to the teacher or to somebody that you trust, a spiritual friend, a wise person. And if you have found that your bodily and mental or verbal deeds are positive and wholesome, or at least some of them are, then you can abide happy and glad, training day and night in wholesome states. Then we also talked about how this kind of virtuous conduct protects ourselves as well as protecting others by giving ourselves and others freedom from fear, enmity and affliction. And that is the first great gift of living a virtuous life. It actually says immeasurable freedom from fear, um, enmity, which is like hatred or anger, ill will, and affliction, any kind of mental or physical suffering. Mostly mental we're talking about here. Then last week we talked about purity and impurity and the 10 causes of wholesome and unwholesome karma. Um, and that 10 is comprised of, I think, three actions of body, four actions of speech, and three actions of mind. So I'm not going to review that this time because we did a little bit of a reflection on it last time. Um, but that one just concluded by saying that if you do engage in those 10 courses of the wholesome karma, in other words, positive actions that leads again to our own and other people's benefit and well-being, um, then when you engage in that, the devas and human beings and other good destinations are discerned. Yeah, and I tried to encourage you by saying to anyone who's worried about their conduct that you've done so well so far, you're already a human being in this life. So that would, by inference, suggest that you already performed many wholesome um, courses of karma, and that's why you would be reborn in what the Buddha classifies as a very good destination. And also that, you know, the destination of a human being may entail more suffering than the destinations of the Deva worlds, but it's also, in a sense, you could say more conducive to understanding suffering simply because of that. You know, if you're, if you're hanging out in the Deva realm, just enjoying bliss, eating bliss, <laughs> they say, you know, feeding on bliss, um, then when that Deva realm starts to fall apart, because it will, it's still not the final goal, you will then experience a sense of sorrow and loss. Um, and you'll find yourself most probably back in the human realm again anyway. So the human realm, it seems to have some kind of balance of suffering and happiness, perhaps to greater or lesser degrees, roughly equal, but you know, it's a mix and it depends on our circumstances and our particular um, life situation from time to time. So the next sutta on tonight's list is Majjhima Nikaya number seven. And this is called the Vatupama Sutta, the simile of the cloth. And Bhikkhu Bodhi here has just chosen a very small excerpt to discuss. But as I said last week, I, I feel that this is worthy of a bit more attention. So I actually brought along the whole sutta to share with you today. Because it seems that to skip 
a sutta that's so kind of key and it's in the first 10 of the Majjhima Nikaya, the kind of uh, foundational suttas, if you like, it would be a little bit of a shame. So, and it brings a lot of the different aspects of practice together when we look at this sutta. So it's talking roughly about 16 defilements of mind. So a lot of the time in my teachings and in Ajahn Brahm's um, way of expanding the Dhamma, we tend to focus much more on the beautiful qualities of mind and talk about watering the flowers and not the weeds, right? So we water the beautiful things and by virtue of that, they tend to crowd out the unwholesome qualities. You know, we incline our mind skillfully towards the beautiful, towards the good. But this one's taking a bit of a closer look at some of the um, impurities, let's say. Um, in the translation here, it says defilements, but I think in the Majjhima Nikaya, the version I have, or a later version, it talks about them as imperfections or impurities, which I think sounds a little bit less kind of severe than defilement. So no, it sounds very kind of Christian, like, <laughs> you know, you've sinned and you've got this like filth in your mind. <laughs> because these are quite ordinary um, qualities that any of us will still be um, encountering from time to time, so long as we're not um, anagamis, basically, so long as we're not beyond craving and aversion. So I prefer words that sound slightly less evaluative and sort of judgmental, um, but the Pali word is kilesa, I'm pretty sure that's the word they've translated, or upakilesa, which would be like uh, a more refined defilement. So, yeah, so I'll start with this sutta. It compares these impurities basically to a dirty cloth, so to the stains that you would find on a cloth. And um, when that cloth is clean, um, the mind becomes joyful and it becomes possible to access and experience higher states of mind, beautiful states of mind called the adhichitta, like the states of samadhi, and also um, the enlightenment experiences of stream winning, once returning, non-returning and full enlightenment arahat. <clears throat> okay, so I'm trying to balance this book on my knee and also get hold of the other book. <laughs> Let's see how we do with the balancing act. <clears throat> so don't worry if you don't have the Majjhima Nikaya at hand, it doesn't really matter because most of the time when I listen to suttas, I just take in the meaning of that sutta and uh, even you can use it as a kind of meditation. So the sutta starts, thus have I heard, and this is always the voice of Venerable Ananda who is repeating uh, what he heard from the Buddha. He was the Buddha's faithful companion for I think, was it 25 or even longer, maybe even 45 years, I forget now. Um, and he had a photographic memory. Is that the right word? He wouldn't have been seeing the word, so I'm not sure it's photographic, but he had an incredible memory and took all these words to heart. So here he's repeating what he heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati in Jeta's Grove, Anatta Pindika's Park. There he addressed the bhikkhus thus. Bhikkhus, venerable sir, they replied. And the Blessed One said this. So, as usual, it's talking about bhikkhus because bhikkhus were the ones who were probably most of the time in the Buddha's presence, but these teachings applied to all. So I'm going to change that to community so that we all feel included. Community, suppose a cloth were defiled and stained and a dyer dipped it in some dye or other, whether blue or yellow, red or carmine, I'm not sure what that is, pink maybe? It would look poorly dyed and impure in colour. Why is that? Because of the impurity of the cloth. So too, when the mind is defiled or impure or imperfect, imperfect an unhappy destination may be expected. So we could see this unhappy destination as being in the future, in terms of a future rebirth that wouldn't be in those favorable conditions, or we could also see it as a destination right there and then, you know, your mind would be uh, soiled, basically, it wouldn't experience that joy that's available when the mind is free from impurities and imperfections. So then he gives a second simile. 
community, suppose a cloth were pure and bright and a dyer dipped it in some dye or other, whether blue or yellow or red or carmine. It would look well dyed and pure in color. Why is that? Because of the purity of the cloth. <clears throat> so too, when the mind is undefiled or pure, a happy destination may be expected. So then we get into the part that was in Bhikkhu Bodhi's um, excerpt. What community are the imperfections that defile or um, obscure, you could say, the mind? Covetousness and unrighteous greed is an imperfection that defiles the mind. I'm just checking that we have the same translation here. And then ill will is an imperfection that defiles the mind. Anger is an imperfection that defiles the mind. Resentment is an imperfection that defiles the mind. Contempt is an imperfection which defiles the mind. Insolence is an imperfection that defiles the mind. Envy is an imperfection that defiles the mind. So here we have a few translations for the word avarice. The one in Bhikkhu Bodhi's book is miserliness. Stinginess is another one that we could use. So it's the opposite of generosity. Yeah, and generosity is a very important foundational factor of training on the path. And then deceit is an imperfection that defiles the mind. Fraud, obstinacy, rivalry, Conceit, arrogance, vanity, and heedlessness. Here it says negligence, but the translate that's a translation of apamada. So heedlessness is much better. It's the opposite of being heedful. And heedfulness is the path to nibbana. They call it the deathless. I like to say no more dying rather than the deathless as some kind of state. So Heedlessness is a defilement that defiles the mind. Yeah. So do you recognize any of those qualities coming up in your mind from time to time? <laughs> it's quite interesting, isn't it? Because um, it's almost like an extension in a way of the five hindrances, you know, ill will, anger, resentment, contempt. They could all be seen as an aspect of aversion or um, hate. Sometimes it's translated as hate which is a very strong translation of dosa. Um, so it includes all of those things. I would even add, you know, frustration or irritation. Um, even depression can be seen as a type of ill will. It's a sort of internalized anger, usually towards ourself. Insolence also, it's a kind of aggression, isn't it? Being insolent, a lack of respect towards others, um, usually based on anger. Yeah, it's usually quite a quick, off-handed response that with a bit more foresight we might avoid. And then, um, what else do we have here? We have quite a few that are not directly connected to the five hindrances, but that are more connected with like the sense of self. So things like conceit, arrogance, vanity, these are all stemming from delusion basically in the belief in, in a sense of self you know a sense of ego needing to defend itself and that could either be through a sense of greed you know wanting to be seen well in the eyes of others or it might also be through aversion you know feeling envious towards somebody else's gains or towards someone else's qualities even their opportunities rather than a mind of mudita that can rejoice in the success and good fortune of others. So it's a slightly aversive state and it can also be coming, as we say, from um, from greed, wishing that we had that feeling covetous. Maybe, you know, how come they get it and I don't, they don't really deserve it. Oh, super. So Luna's written imperfection as chittasa upakilesa. OK, maybe that's the way it's been translated here. That's great. So, yeah, um, the mind's defilements, basically, or imperfections. Yeah. 
And then uh, obviously the negligence or the heedlessness is um, an imperfection that really defiles the mind because if we're heedless, it's very, very difficult to even be able to differentiate between the positive and, and negative states of mind. You know, it's, we're being quite careless about how we use our mind. There's a real lack of mindfulness there. It's kind of the opposite of being careful, isn't it? I often think that the word mindfulness could almost almost be translated as carefulness, you know, being full of care about what we're doing, intentionally caring, knowing what we're doing and why. So that's satisampajanya, which is the opposite of this uh, heedlessness. So it's important to consider, I think, I was hearing a talk by Ajahn Brahmali on this topic, and he was saying that the five hindrances come up much more often in the uh, suttas, you know, they're throughout the suttas and they're the real kind of um, basic hindrances that need to be overcome in order to be able to purify our mind to the point that it can um, experience beautiful lofty states of mind, states of samadhi, states of bliss and joy and a deeply sort of contented type of happiness that comes from basically letting go not a kind of happiness that comes through acquiring or that's based on the sense of self, but the happiness of peace, the happiness of renunciation. Yeah. So those five hindrances are always our sort of first concern in a sense, but I think it's really helpful to also look at these um, variations on that theme, just to check whether there might be other um, imperfections of mind that we could perhaps use different strategies for. So envy is a good example, you know, because it's not just ill will or greed, but it's something that is the opposite of like, for example, mudita. So then we can actually employ the opposite, the uh, antidote to that envy a little bit more skillfully. So shall I pause here? Oh, it says in the footnote. Okay. So in the footnote, it's defined as chetasa upakilesa. That's very nice. Yeah. So any questions or comments so far? I mean, it'd be really interesting just to hear from anyone who's maybe noticed how any of these imperfections do um, seem to dirty the mind in a way using that simile of the cloth and make it impure and make it harder to soak up that dye, you know, the dye of loving kindness, the dye of mindfulness, of um, generosity, yeah harder to uh, take those beautiful colors when we have these imperfections working. Does anyone want to share anything that they've noticed? Nope, all good to go. We might even get through a whole sutta then. <laughs> okay, so the next passage says, knowing that covetousness and unrighteous greed is an imperfection that defiles the mind, a person abandons it. And it's the same sequence for all of these. So knowing that ill will is an imperfection that defiles the mind, a person abandons it. Yeah, and it goes through all of these, knowing that anger, resentment, contempt, insolence, envy, um, stinginess, deceit, fraud, obstinacy, rivalry, conceit, arrogance, and vanity are imperfections that defile the mind, one abandons them. Yeah. So this is the word pahana, abandoning. And it's actually the word that's used as well in the second noble truth. The Buddha defines the cause of suffering in the second noble truth as craving, especially craving for sense desire, craving to be, and also craving not to be. So the kind of craving to just annihilate oneself. Um, and the way to what should be done with that cause of suffering is that it should be abandoned. So for each of these four noble truths, we have um, an action to take. Yeah, so suffering should be known. The cause of suffering should be abandoned. Um, the third one, um, the way to abandon that, letting go, um, giving away generosity should be known. And then the last one, the noble path should be developed. So here we have um, abandoning again. So obviously this, these also could be seen as causes for suffering, right? That could come under the second noble truth. And I do want to share something that Ajahn Brahmali was saying 
in a talk I listened to earlier today about the word knowing here, because you can easily skip over these things and think, oh yeah, you just know, and then you abandon it. But he was talking about different levels of knowing. And let me see if I can, uh, if I've jotted it down. So yeah, the first one, which I think is my own invention, is that um, the first stage of knowing these defilements, I think, would be um, being able to discern whether they lead to our benefit or harm, being able to actually understand this is a defilement rather than a quality to keep, right? We have to know what's to be abandoned and what's to be cultivated and maintained. So it could simply be that knowing, which is part of right view, as we've discussed before, that can discern between what's unwholesome and wholesome. That's the first step in right view. And then the second step actually is knowing that one abandons uh, wrong view and cultivates right view using mindfulness, of course. So this can happen very easily also through our practice in the day. It's pretty easy, isn't it, to know whether or not um, something is wholesome by its effect, both on your mind and on the people that you live with, the people that are around you. You know, sometimes we think we're coming from a good place and then somebody reacts in a way that seems quite offended and then you realise, oh, okay, maybe I was being kind, but there was some kind of ulterior motive there. Or maybe, you know, I was telling them about meditation with a slight judgment, thinking they should meditate and be like me. <laughs> and then we wonder why we get an unwholesome response. So I think learning to know that is actually quite a big job, you know, learning to get more closely in touch with our motivation, with where we're coming from. And then Ajahn Brahmali was saying there's another kind of knowing that comes after abandoning these things. And I think this is a very powerful kind of knowing because sometimes when we're actually involved in them, you know, overtaken by them, we might think, we might not even notice that, first of all. But even sometimes we think that we've completely overcome them, but there still may be a subtle trace lingering in the mind. And this is one of the reasons that we don't get into deep samadhi, you know, because whenever the five hindrances are operating, there is that um, barrier to seeing things clearly, to really being able to let go. And I actually noticed that in my own practice in um, Burma, because I was sitting in meditation with pretty strong mindfulness for days and months, weeks, months on end and being very aware of my meditation object, my meditation subject, which was basically impermanence through observing the arising and passing away of bodily sensations. And yet, you know, the, the deep states of samadhi, although some people say that the, you know, mindfulness that you develop through Vipassana practice can be of equal um, strength, the deep states of samadhi were not happening for me. And I realized one of the reasons is because in that practice, we'd still be moving the mind. We'd still be kind of moving it part by part. Sometimes the mind would be stiller, but the object itself would be moving. And so that does engender a subtle kind of restlessness. And I realized that could be the lingering hindrance in this state, in this case. Like it wasn't very obvious that there was aversion or craving or tiredness I was barely sleeping very much and you know really bright and aware but there was still a sense of like being involved in a way that that created some restlessness and I think this may have been um, one of the reasons so this second kind of knowing is to know after abandoning which means after coming out of a deep state of samadhi and being completely free from those five hindrances which would include all of these um, 16 imperfections as well and then realizing how it feels to be free, you know, a kind of deep peace and joy and inner happiness that you've probably never experienced before. So at that time, it becomes much, much clearer what those defilements actually are. It's a little bit like that simile that Ajahn Brahm gives about the tadpole um, in the water. So there's this little tadpole and it grows up in the water. You might have all heard it before and it swims in the water and it studies the water and it maybe even has a PhD on water and the composition of the water. <laughs> but there's a difference between a, um, a tadpole and a fish. And the difference is that one day that tadpole starts to grow some little legs and then it sort of doesn't really know what it's doing. 
But just by chance, it suddenly one day jumps out of that pond and experiences dry land. And perhaps the water starts to dry up or so on its body, especially when it becomes a frog, right? And after that, it has a perspective on what water is. It's the absence of that water that makes it clear, much clearer um, what that water really was, because as long as they were in the water, it was like a second skin, right? It's like we can't imagine how we would be if we'd been brought up with a different family or in different conditions. You know, the way that we are and the way that we behave in the world seems so completely natural and normal to us. And yet for somebody else or even for ourselves, when we're able to step out of that, we realize, oh, actually, you know, like my best friend told me the other, um, that, that my friend who I grew up with, she told me when she came to visit that um, I'd been to a really traditional, quite conservative, strict school. And I honestly didn't realize that because to me, that was just what a girl's school was like. And I didn't like the place. And I knew I rebelled quite a lot, but I had no idea that it was quite conservative until she told me. <laughs> and then it made a lot of sense, you know, as to why I'm such a good girl all the time and over conscientious and, you know, what seems like a small little, well, actually, to me and to my mom, it seemed like a big rebellion, but actually it wasn't, you know, <laughs> actually the school was just really strict. Um, so sometimes it's quite interesting. We need to actually really jump out of our um, situation to see more clearly how and where we've been stuck. So this is the kind of knowing that comes after leaving those states, leaving them behind. And then of course, you know, because it's Samadhi and it's not permanent, it's not gonna permanently overcome those hindrances. You might be able to see them slowly creeping back in. I'm sure many of you have had that experience, especially after a retreat. Mine feels polished, it feels really nice and bright. And then something happens, you know, usually you just go to a shop or something and everyone looks kind of grumpy and it's like oh quite deflating or there's just a lot of sense import and you start to realize you're getting a little bit reactive again and you start to see these things just creeping back in it becomes very very clear how they arise and how they develop and multiply so with this repeated experience of samadhi you get really used to kind of going in and out in and out of the water so to speak in and out of the defiled mind and the purified mind so it becomes much, much clearer what these things are. And then the third um, interpretation could be um, the experience of a stream winner. So somebody who, and I, I mean, Ajahn Brahmali was saying he thinks this is more referring to a stream winner, but in the um, commentaries, it talks about the anagami. And I think that also could be the case because even for a stream winner, these things will still be there from time to time. But because of their right view, they'll be able to, um, see them very quickly and basically there isn't that sense of self that's going to be fueling them you know there's not this oh I'm feeling this way or like I need this thing that somebody else has got because there's not much of a well there's no um, view of a self anymore they may arise due to past conditioning but they won't sustain themselves very long and so for a stream winner also it's very easy to know these things through a clear knowledge and quite easy to abandon them with a lot more ease than it would be for someone still um, not even training. They actually say the training begins with stream winning. So the, the, the stream winners are really trainees and we're training to be trainees, if you like. <laughs> we're just training to develop right view and to um, direct our efforts towards the right path. So we're learning to get on that eightfold path at this stage. So any questions or comments so far? I, I'm not sure that some of these sessions are more like discussions, some are more like uh, presentations, I suppose, but it'd be really nice to hear from someone just to make it a little bit alive. So I've got a couple of questions here in the notes. So Crystal's asking, where do you put the limit between obstinacy and perseverance? <laughs> <laughs> that is such a great question that I can very well relate to and I guess I'm working on. <laughs> Earlier today I was speaking with uh, Kelly who's helping me on my website and uh, she said she was trying to you know get the website so that we can have a different picture on every page and she said I'm really stubborn so I don't want to give up until I figured it out. I said oh I, I totally relate I'm very stubborn too because I don't want to give up with this project you know, it's like I won't give up with it until it actually happens. You know, I just, it's so hard for me to give up. 
So in a way, that's a kind of obstinacy. It's a kind of stubbornness, but it can be obviously put to very good use if it's in the service of good things. So long as I think we don't overstretch ourselves, we don't, um, what's the word? Like, there's this lovely word in the sort of called like out meditate or over meditate. <laughs> it's a bit like that in terms of work as well, sort of going beyond our limits and, and neglecting self-care because then the mind can become quite hard. And I think obstinacy in this case is probably that hardened mind when it's become like you're just rigidly fixed to your view and you're not going to shift. So actually that's quite different from the other quality of, you know, the positive quality of stubbornness. But I can see that it can lead towards obstinacy if we're not careful. Um, obstinacy as far as, hang on, let me just, I've gone on to the second question about that. So the limit between obstinacy and perseverance, I guess the thing is that perseverance is coming from um, courage, from loyalty, from a sense of responsibility, um, not wanting to easily give up because of sort of maybe unpleasant feelings or confusion or doubt, right? So you need a certain amount of direction and commitment to achieve anything worthwhile in life. Obstinacy, I would say, is when we just refuse to see our faults, we refuse to see other people's perspectives and uh, take any advice, you know. So I think they're quite different, but I suppose we have to know for ourselves by the effect it has on our mind. Please do unmute and or put your hand up if you want me to go any further on that, because I'm just working it out as I speak. So Janik is saying, obstinacy, as far as I understand, does not explain hindrances. Obstinacy could be misunderstood and misinterpreted if the observer does not understand the observant. Yeah, and I think, you know, this isn't really about us figuring out whether other people have these qualities or not. This is about us looking at our own mind. And I guess using the simile here, we can understand whether there's obstinacy or not, depending on whether the mind can take up beautiful qualities it can still take up that dye so remember all of these things are likened to stains on a cloth yeah things that are actually um clouding the mind or um dirtying making it not beautiful making it difficult to take up the dye could you say a little more about the benefits of revealing misconduct to a spiritual friend yeah it depends what you would like me to say I mean from my own experience in the monastic life and even before the monastic life with Lena for example because she's my closest Dhamma sister I would say um, it becomes very natural to want to do that if you have a trusted friend because you're really trying to get closer and closer to truth you know you're working on yourself you're trying to be to have your body and speech more and more aligned with your understanding of the Dhamma with your ethics, with your values. And so it becomes quite a natural thing. And also to check in with a friend if you're not sure about your conduct to say, you know, I'm not sure, like, I think I came from a good place, but perhaps there was something in the way I said it or the way I did it, the timing or whatever, that wasn't very skillful because it had such and such effect. And then a good friend will usually reflect back to you in a really positive way, seeing your best, you know, taking, uh, giving you the benefit of the doubt but also just reflecting back some in a way that can be quite helpful. So I do think it's important to have that amount of trust with somebody. Um, as a bhikkhuni, we have the Vinaya and the Patimoka. Um, so unfortunately, I can't do it now because I don't have other bhikkhunis, but in a community with another four, three bhikkhunis, so when there would be four, um, we would recite the Patimoka, 311 training precepts for nuns and we would basically mention any of those that we hadn't been able to keep we would just mention it to each other so that it was disclosed and so we didn't feel that there was anything you know that we were trying to conceal and just in the disclosing of it is usually enough you know most uh, monastics who are properly trained won't then sort of judge or punish you or you know kind of isolate you or anything like that it's quite an impersonal process so there are certain procedures to undertake for example forfeiting something if you've taken something you shouldn't have taken or just confessing most of them are just confessions most of the time and that's enough 
there's no punishment beyond that. And then for some of the more gross offences, there might be, say, a two week penance where you have to actually, that's quite embarrassing if it happens, because you would have to actually stand at the back of the line. So everybody would know you'd <laughs> made an offence that was quite, you know, quite gross, quite coarse, and you would be at the back. But it happens. You know, and people sort of laugh about it and say, oh, that monk's at the back. I wonder what that was about, you know, and it's one of two things usually. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's not for the purpose of shaming, but it's for the purpose of um, so that you don't end up concealing things which would cause a lot of inner conflict and a lack of, you know, inner integrity. So even if you're not able to do it the first time at the first party moki, you can always do it the second at the next one and say, I'm sorry, I concealed it for like a month, you know. And uh, yeah, and that's usually enough. So I, I'm happy with either comment, live or chat. I think most of the time people put it in the chat because they might want a bit more privacy. But if you do want to ask a question or, or make a comment uh, verbally you won't be videoed it'll only be your voice that's recorded so shall we go to someone with a hand up yeah um maxel could you unmute please thank you um the, there was just a couple of thoughts in what you've been saying uh one is like associated with perhaps my anger I have a mother-in-law who has fairly severe Alzheimer's um, and there I find I lack generosity of time mm -hmm. um, and I find that quite hard actually. Um, and then there was another thought about the streaming or anything, it's maybe a frivolous thought, but if you jump into a stream that's going too fast, you drown. Mm -hmm. So just two, two thoughts from what you were saying and what have yeah. you that came into my mind. Thank you, thank you. I'm just, can I clarify whether those thoughts are related, like in the sense of jumping into the stream? Do you, are you relating that at all to how you might feel around your mother-in-law when you feel it's getting too much or? No, no, no. Okay, no. all right. I just <laughs> somehow connected. Yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, really good, isn't it? Really good to reflect in those ways. I, probably, I hadn't just... thought of that. I could probably, when I've had too much, go and run and jump in the stream. The stream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that might help. That's another way to interpret yeah. it. <laughs> I was more thinking in terms of like, because I guess my usual response to these things is that although it's wonderful to notice that perhaps you mm. could be a bit more generous and you're noticing perhaps the pain and the contraction that comes from feeling like mm. I don't know like you're trying to conserve your yourself but at the same time can you notice what you are giving can you notice the time yeah. you do spend with her and just you know acknowledge that it's hard that you know it's it's mm -hmm. uh, there's some suffering involved for you and be kind to that suffering because I think when we're kind to the suffering it actually enables us to stay with that suffering for mm. longer. And that might be one way of both acknowledging your feeling and also being able to spend a little bit longer with her. Yeah, be kind to your own suffering. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. thank you. That's very good. help you not to just, mm. you know, withdraw so soon. Thanks, that's lovely, thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. yeah. And may I ask Jane? to unmute please. Thank you. I was just um, thinking about it's 20 hours thinking about obstinacy. Um, it, I think for me, obstinacy has a closed quality, mm -hmm. closed present experience. Mm -hmm. And perseverance has more of an open quality mm -hmm. present experience. Mm -hmm. So the obstinacy is about for me holding on to a pre-existing mindset. Yeah. That then doesn't change according to the circumstances. But perseverance can actually be very flexible. Um, it has an open quality around, because I think the motivation is different. Motivation. Yeah obstinacy and the motivation for perseverance feel like they come from different places yeah. so that open closing I think I'm clearer that 
Obstinacy is closed. It's yeah. closed to whatever is in front of you at the moment mm -hmm. or whatever mm -hmm. you're experiencing. That, that's what I could hold on to. That's beautiful, very succinct and um, very visceral feelings that you're describing, things we can feel in our body. We can feel it when we start to contract and shut down, yeah. And I think that's a beautiful way to describe perseverance because like you say, sometimes you have to, it's almost like we keep starting again, isn't it? Sometimes it's not necessarily that we're just carrying on down the same track. It's more that as the different obstacles or the different challenges appear, we have to keep on finding ways to navigate them and we might have to really change tactic, change course. So obstinacy wouldn't allow that, would it? It'd almost be in opposition to perseverance because you try one thing it doesn't work you work you refuse to try anything else <laughs> yeah yeah that's great i love that thank you really nice reflection okay anything else or should we continue keep going yeah. great so we now know things that we didn't know before and this is really nice so after we've known this okay so this suggests that we are now stream winners, actually, as Ajahn Brahmali said. Um, so negligence is an imperfection that defiles the mind and one abandons it. When a bhikkhu has known, okay, so it's going through all of them again. When a person has known that all of these things are in imperfections that defile the mind, and has abandoned them, they acquire unwavering confidence in the Buddha thus. The blessed one is accomplished, fully enlightened, perfect in true knowledge and conduct, sublime, knower of the worlds, incomparable leader of persons to be tamed, teacher of gods and humans, enlightened and blessed. Does anyone recognize that? from the chanting that's done in monasteries. Iti piso bhagawa araham, sama sambuddha. So this is the first place, I think, if I remember correctly, in the Pali Canon or in the Majjhima Nikaya that uh, this, these verses are, are described. So this is straight after knowing how to abandon those things. We have unshakable, unwavering confidence in the Buddha. So that unwavering confidence is usually talked about as a quality and a characteristic of a stream winner, you know, because until then we all have a certain level of confidence, quite a lot, perhaps, if we've been walking on this path for a while. But it's the kind of confidence that's still slightly provisional, like we're still checking it out, you know. We've got enough confidence to say, well, the last step I took had beneficial results, it seemed to work. You know, the things that Buddha talked about happened and I did start to become a more peaceful person. I started to have more equanimity in my life and, you know, more peace, more kindness. So maybe if I take the next steps, you know, I'll get some of the benefits the Buddha describes later on as well. So we have enough con confidence, I call it inspired confidence at this point, um, to keep walking on the path. But a stream winner has unshakable confidence because they've actually verified for themselves that these things work and they know where they lead. You know, they know that this path actually leads to enlightenment. They know that without a doubt because they've experienced the first stage of enlightenment. Yeah. So how can you ever have doubt again? And that's why this person is said to be um, in training in the sense that there's only one direction the path can now lead. They can never go back. From that knowledge that you know their right view has been perfected and they're basically bound for nibbana they're bound for full liberation um, and they're also independent in the buddha's dispensation they don't really need teachers anymore although it'd be nice for them to live around fellow monastics or you know spiritual companions that would probably start happening very naturally but they actually have a, a very clear map within themselves so, and as we say, you know, things can still happen. There may still arise greed or aversion in the mind, but they know straight away that this is, you know, this is not the Dhamma, this is not worth holding on to. And they overcome that very quickly. I've seen that for myself, not in Ajahn Brown because I haven't seen him ever 
show signs of anger, but my teacher in Burma, he has. And I noticed that it came very fast, very quickly, in quite a way that surprised me. And then it was like all dissolved, like almost instantly. Yeah. And there was also no like self berating that I could see. Like he just carried on like as though, okay, this is a phenomenon that happened. And then the thing is, it's not taken personally. Yeah. So that was quite interesting. And also to see that, you know, these things would happen only under the most immense amount of responsibility and pressure that anyone else who was not a stream winner would have long ago since, you know, kind of crashed out and been reactive about much, much smaller things. So then the next one is that one acquires unwavering confidence in the Dhamma thus. The Dhamma is well proclaimed by the Blessed One, visible here and now, immediately effective. That's a nice translation. Inviting inspection, onward leading, to be experienced by the wise for themselves. So this is both the teachings and also the, the goal, the results of those teachings, the Dhamma. And then one acquires unwavering confidence in the Sangha thus. The Sangha of the Blessed One's disciples is practicing the good way, the straight way, the true way, practicing the proper way. That is the four pairs of persons, that's uh, the four stages of enlightenment, the eight types of individuals. So in each one, there's both the person who's practicing for that stage and the one who's attained that stage. This Sangha of the Blessed One's disciples is worthy of gifts, worthy of hospitality, worthy of offerings, worthy of reverential salutation. I prefer respect. We usually chant respect, but I, I think the words Anjali, so it does literally mean folding the hands together the way they still do in modern India today and in Buddhist countries. And they become an unsurpassed field of merit for the world. So if you offer to these people, then... Your heart is much happier, you get more benefit, and perhaps that's partly to do with the joy that arises in your heart, but also because by um, helping to provide livelihood for such beings, you're helping them disseminate the Dhamma. So the Dhamma continues for a long, long time, which is very beautiful. And we spoke about that in also in the very first lesson, the very first Sutta class, it's the first aspect of right view isn't it, to understand that there are aesthetics and Brahmins in the world who are practicing properly. And the point of the Buddha uh, mentioning that is that these people are fields of merit, so we can make very good karma. So Jane has the book, but she's lost. Um, so we're in the big Majjhima Nikaya rather than Bhikkhu Bodhis, and we're on now page 119, number eight, paragraph eight is the next paragraph. And uh, we probably won't even get through this sutta at this rate. <laughs> but I hope it doesn't matter. I hope that the content and the discussion is, is more important than the speed. <laughs> so, when one has given up, expelled, released, abandoned and relinquished the imperfections of the mind in part, they consider thus. I'm possessed of unwavering confidence in the Buddha and they gain inspiration in the meaning and inspiration in the Dhamma. They gain gladness connected with the Dhamma. So this is my favorite part really, because I think this is so beautiful. And I know how it felt for me when I first, you know, developed confidence in the, in the Dhamma, mostly in the Dhamma, because that was my first entry point to the triple gem. Um, the inspiration in the meaning means, um, the meaning of the teachings, but also where they're leading to. So the goal, the fact that there is a goal of enlightenment and it's possible. There's a path that can lead us in that direction that can at least take us a step closer. The more we practice, it's one more step. So inspiration in the meaning, inspiration in the Dhamma. So inspiration in the practice, in the teachings, and probably also in the results. And they gain gladness connected with the Dhamma. So you now might recognize this sequence from other sequences where the Buddha talks about the process into deep samadhi. So it's from this gladness and in some of the suttas like the sutta and the Anguttara, I think it's one, 101 or something called volition. He actually says that if there's gladness, there's no need to 
make an intention, may joy arise or may uh, piti arise because it's natural for one who has gladness, pamoja, that piti arises. But here it doesn't say that it's natural, it just gives the sequence. So it says, when one is glad, rapture is born, that's piti. In one who is rapturous, the body becomes tranquil. So that's kaya pasadi. In one whose body is tranquil, they feel pleasure. So from tranquility, pasadi, sukha arises. And in one who feels pleasure, sukha, so this is the wholesome happiness, not just sensual, it's not sensual happiness. The mind becomes stilled. So here, of course, it says concentrated, but our preferred rendering for the word samadhi is still rather than concentrated. So again, we've got that proximate um, cause for samadhi, which is sukha, which is, you could say bliss, you could say contentment, you could say um, wholesome joy, wholesome happiness. It's very refined. And so this little verse is talking about the inspiration that creates gladness, but then the rest of this, from the gladness to the rapture, is actually the process in meditation and that can start to arise. And as I say, all the suttas make it very clear that this is a natural process. So in a sense, again, it's another version of that natural sequence, starting from overcoming the hindrances and then having the inspiration that arises from that, and that becomes a stepping stone into the deep states of meditation. And then it repeats that little passage again. So then they consider thus, I am possessed of unwavering confidence in the Sangha. And they gain inspiration in the meaning, inspiration in the Dhamma and gladness connected to the Dhamma. Okay, and again, the same sequence. So this happens from inspiration in the Buddha, Dhamma and the Sangha. Then one considers thus, the imperfections of mind have been in part given up expelled, released, abandoned, and relinquished. Oh, it's the same one again. And they gain inspiration in the meaning, inspiration in the Dhamma, gladness connected with the Dhamma. When they're glad, rapture is born. In one who is rapturous, piti, the body becomes tranquil. In one who, whose body is tranquil, they feel pleasure. In one who feels pleasure, sukha, the mind, becomes stilled samadhi. So now we have a little simile again about the cloth. So it says bhikkhus or community. If someone of such virtue, such a state of concentration or stillness, let's say, uh, and such wisdom eats alms food consisting of choice hill rice along with various sauces and curries, even that would be no obstacle for them. <laughs> so here it's um, alluding to the idea that if we eat too many luxurious things, we'll fall into indulgence, you know, we'll um, develop a lot of craving for that food and become very attached to like a, a very refined kind of food and perhaps become fairly difficult to support. But here it's saying, even if they get that, it won't be a problem because of course there won't be very, really any clinging for that any craving for that. Just as a cloth is defiled and stained, sorry, that is defiled and stained, becomes pure and bright with the help of clear water, or just as gold becomes pure and bright with the help of a furnace, so too, if someone of such virtue eats alms food, that will be no obstacle for them. So even though the rice and the curries and stuff could be considered a defilement because of that pure mind, which is likened here to clean water or to gold being made pure and bright with a furnace, those impurities will be quickly washed away. That's the idea. And then it's nice because it's talking about practicing the Brahma Viharas. And um, in Ajahn Brahmali's uh, discussion that I listened to earlier, he said that it seems as though Often in the suttas, these practice of the Brahma Viharas is, is almost equivalent to the four jhanas, but also that they seem to be slightly higher than that too. They seem to be practices that are often done after the four jhanas, which are usually um, 
practice through the anapana, through observing the breath. Um, and it's interesting to me that they come in at this place because in my experience of people who have, you know, practice deeply and even become stream winners, or at least I have confidence that that is the case. Um, they tend to have a lot of loving kindness, a lot of compassion and mudita and equanimity. And it might be because it's easy for them to practice it, or it might be because they've been practicing it all along, who knows. But it seems as though when there are no impurities or imperfections in the mind, these qualities just easily come forth. They easily, um, there's nothing to stop them, right? If there's no ill will, then there's no obstacle to loving kindness. If there's no, um, I guess, things on the side of aversion, like grief or despair, then there's no real obstacle to compassion, right? Or if there's like no um, lack of empathy, say, right? There's no obstacle to compassion. People have empathy at this point. And then if there's no envy, it's very easy and spontaneous to develop mudita, altruistic joy, joy for others' success and for our own as well. And then the equanimity is naturally there because we understand that all the vicissitudes of life are just part and parcel of being human, of being in samsara. What else can we expect? So there's such an acceptance of suffering and an understanding of suffering that, you know, they, they don't take that personally anymore. And the mind is equanimous, it's cool, it's serene. So one abides pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with loving kindness. Likewise, the second, third and fourth. So above, below, around and everywhere, as to all, as to oneself. One pervade, abides pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with loving kindness. Abundant, exalted, immeasurable without hostility and without ill will. And that's also a lovely little chant that we do at many of our um, monasteries. Metta Sahagatena, some of you might know it, but I won't chant it now. Maybe we should chant it at one of our metta sessions because it's just another um, really nice metta chant. So the same sequence continues for all the other four. So how far are we? I think I'll read through to the end at this point and I might I might miss out that poem because uh, the poem is just an elaboration on the text. So when one knows and sees thus their mind is liberated from the taint of sensual desire, the taint of being and the taint of delusion. When it is liberated, there, be, there comes the knowledge, it is liberated. One understands birth is destroyed, the holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more coming to any state of existence. So by now one is fully enlightened and this is a beautiful passage that again is repeated. It's there at the end of the Anattalakana Sutta. Um, don't think it's in the Dhamma Chakra, but something very similar is there, but it's definitely at the end of the um, Anattalakana Sutta because that was the first five arahats after the Buddha. I just think it's so beautiful to imagine that what had to be done has been done. Can you imagine the relief? Ah, oh. <laughs> not only with the project, but just with life. <laughs> We've lived our purpose to its fullest and there's no more coming to any state of being, it says here. But it means any state of existence, whether in the human, animal, God, or any world, any realm, not even in the most reified realms. This is called one bathed with the inner bathing. So the reason that the Buddha now brings in bathing is because he was speaking to a Brahmin who believed that he could purify his mind just by going to the Ganga and washing in the water there. So the Buddha is saying that that water of the Ganges, which is actually anyway quite filthy these days, very filthy, and people still go and even put it in their mouth. He says that is not going to um, get you liberated. It seems very obvious, but of course, these were the Brahmanical beliefs in that time and still today in India. So this is called the 
uh, being bathed with the inner bathing. It's very beautiful, isn't it? So liberation is an inside job. Now on that occasion, the Brahma, Brahmin Sundarika Bharat Raja was sitting not far from the Blessed One. Then he said to the Blessed One, but does Master Gautama go to the Bahuka River to bathe? Why Brahmin go to the Bahuka River? What can the Bahuka River do? Master Gautama, that's the Buddha. The Bahuka River is held by many to give liberation. It is held by many to give merit and by many to wash away their evil actions in the Bahuka. Bahuka River. Oh, this is the Buddha's verse. Okay, I guess I have to read it. <laughs> Are you ready for it? Bahuka and Adikaka. These are different rivers, I think. Gaya and Sundarika too. Payaga and Sarasati. That's Sarasvati River now. And the stream Bahumati. A fool may there forever bathe, yet will not purify dark deeds. What can the Sundarika bring to pass? What the Payaga? What the Bahuka? They cannot purify an evildoer, one who's done cruel and brutal deeds. One pure in heart has evermore the feast of spring, the holy day. One fair in act, one pure in heart, brings their virtue to perfection. It is here, Brahmin, that you should bathe to make yourself a refuge for all beings. And if you speak no falsehood, no, nor work harm, oh sorry, nor work harm for living beings, nor take what is offered not with faith and free from avarice, what need for you to go to Gaya? For any well will be your Gaya. So you'll be able to tap into that beautiful, pure, inner water, if you like, the clean, beautiful spring fountain within, and you won't need anything external at all. When this was said, the Brahmin Sundarika Bharadvaja said, Magnificent Master Gautama, Magnificent Master Gautama. Master Gautama has made the Dhamma clear in many ways, as though he were turning upright what had been overthrown, revealing what was hidden, showing the way to one who was lost, or holding up a lamp in the dark, for those with eyesight to see forms. I go to Master Gautama for refuge and to the Dhamma and to the Sangha of Bhikkhus. I would like to receive the going forth under Master Gautama. I would receive the full admission. So they're going to ordain now as a Buddhist monk. That's pretty big reversal, isn't it? And the Brahmin Sundarika Bharadvaja received the going forth under the Blessed One and received the full admission, that means full ordination. And soon, not long after his full admission, dwelling alone, withdrawn, in other words, in solitude, diligent, ardent and resolute, the Venerable Bharadvaja, by realizing for himself with direct knowledge here and now, entered upon and abided in that supreme goal of the holy life for the sake of which clansmen rightly go forth from the home life into homelessness. He directly knew birth is destroyed. The holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more coming to any state of existence. And the venerable Bharadvaja became one of the Arahats. <laughs> so a nice little story at the end, which seemed to sort of I'm sure there's a reason that that's put in there. I think it's not in all the versions of this sutta in the Chinese, but it's in some of them. Um, but it's somehow very nice when it's brought to life in that way. And it seems so short, doesn't it, from someone ordaining to realizing full liberation. But I think it just shows the power of receiving the teachings from the Buddha directly. And of course, there may have been a little bit more time involved there. Sometimes it says, you know, in no long time one became fully liberated, but sometimes no long time means like 20 or 30 years. So there's definitely hope. And of course, who knows what they did in their past lives as well. So that is that sutta. And we've managed to get through like three lines in this book <laughs> because I wanted to read the whole sutta. But uh, I think it's a very beautiful one that talks about basically the results of abandoning those imperfections of the mind, 
and how that leads to inspiration, you know, to deep confidence in the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha, and then that inspiration in the path, inspiration in the Dhamma that can be put directly into your meditation practice so that a natural process starts to unfold. And yeah, all the way through practicing the Burma Viharas as well. It's very beautiful. So we have only four more minutes. And uh, I guess I'd just like to see if there's any one person maybe that hasn't asked or commented that really feels the urge, just in case. Otherwise, we will, I will invite Kelly, I think, today to give a little, a few words before we end. Yes, thank you very much, Venerable Chanda, for this evening's Sutta discussion. Uh, I'd like to say a few words about dana, the uh, practice of generosity. So today's Sutta discussion is offered on a donation basis, and any contribution that you uh, would like to make to provide for Venerable Chanda's uh, material needs to help her contribute, uh, continue to spread the Dhamma and to support the development of the first Bikuni Monastery in the UK would be very gratefully received. Uh, more information about uh, both the project and how to donate is on the Anacampa website, um, for which the link is in the chat box. Thank you very much. I'll Thank you. Again. Thank you very much, Kelly. And. Uh, yeah, so just a few words about the next things coming up. So tomorrow morning, there will be a meta meditation. And um, what's the next thing? Obviously, the chanting next week and probably the sutta class, unless I'm really tired. But next, uh, oh, no, this weekend on Sunday, I have a one day retreat. That's right. So Saturday, meta class. <laughs> and then Sunday, I'm doing a day retreat for London Insight about the beautiful mind, beautifying the mind, which will be less about, actually, it's a good contrast to this because this is more about the imperfections. That'll be more about the beautiful qualities we can develop. And then uh, and then next week starts Ajahn Brahmali's retreat, eight day online retreat. So um, I'm very glad for all those who are going to be joining us there. There's still places if anyone does suddenly realize they've got eight free days in their life, <laughs> which you never know, it could happen. But uh, we do have places available. We also have quite a nice sizable group of about 45 people. So it's going to be really something special. And actually in essence, what he will be talking about is that same sequence we just discussed. So the sequence, probably from suffering or from virtue, it can start at different places and then to confidence, to rapture, to joy, tranquility, etc. So it'll be a lot about that. Um, and that's the sequence known as transcendental dependent liberation. So it's not just the opposite of dependent origination. It's actually a different sequence that takes us from the point of suffering to full liberation. So that's the theme of that retreat. And it will all be um, live streamed and recorded and hopefully uploaded the very same day, or at least you'll get like today, tomorrow, right? You'll get it a day apart or something. But my team are working really hard to try and get those videos out. So you feel like you can join in or at least tap in a little bit. Okay, so thank you so much. Really lovely to see everyone, special, nice, Surprised to see my very dear Dhamma sister as well. You're all, of course, very dear, but it's something special when you have Dhamma sisters who've been on this path with you for several decades, isn't it now? Two decades now. Very awesome. <laughs> so let's unmute you if you wish and we can wave goodbye. <laughs>